Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jacob Breyer, a member of the Barrington Town Council, and I'm joined this evening by my co-host, Liana Kassar. Representative Kassar is in her second term representing District 66, which is Barrington and Riverside. Her legislative priorities are good government, economic justice, reproductive justice, and environmental stewardship. During her first term, she was a strong supporter of the Reproductive Privacy Act, raising the minimum wage, and addressing chronic homelessness. She currently serves on the House Committees on Health and Human Services and Small Business, and will be prioritizing racial and gender equity during her second term through legislation and advocacy, including the Equality and Abortion Coverage Act, and advocating for pay equity and for workers in the care economy. A few weeks ago, I became more curious about the various issues and projects that will be supported by the bonds that are on the ballot. And I figured if I had questions, other people probably did as well. So I reached out to Representative Kassar and I asked her if she'd be interested in working with me to create an opportunity for the community to learn a little bit more about these. And she had the fantastic idea of inviting Treasurer Magaziner to join us. Seth Magaziner is Rhode Island's general treasurer. Since taking office in 2015, he's committed his office to promoting economic growth and expanding opportunity through honest, effective leadership. Seth was born in Bristol and began his career as a public elementary school teacher and then as an investment professional. As treasurer, he has effectively managed the state's pension system, championed the expansion of the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank to fund energy efficiency and renewable energy products. Uh, he's launched the Bank Local Program, which has supported hundreds of loans to small businesses in Rhode Island, moving thousands of dollars of the state's cash back into local community banks and credit unions. And he led a once-in-a-generation investment in public school infrastructure, which paid dividends to Barrington, um, giving us um, many more dollars in matching funds when we built our new middle school. Now I'd like to turn it over to Treasurer Magaziner. Um, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Councilman Breyer. Thank you to my friend, Representative Kassar, both of you uh, for your leadership for the town of Barrington and for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, as some of your viewers may know, I'm a born and raised East Bay kid myself growing up in Bristol. Uh, it has been an honor to serve as treasurer for the last six years. And um, tonight's topic is an important one. Uh, because we are in a time of crisis and tremendous challenges for our state, and we all have the opportunity, uh, special election, to vote yes on seven bond proposals that will help our state recover by putting Rhode Islanders to work on these projects in the short term and making our state more economically competitive and improving our quality of life over the long run. Um, so with that, uh, we will begin our presentation. Um, we are in a time of crisis, and uh, just by way of illustration, uh, this is the number of jobs in Rhode Island over the past uh, two years or so, uh, and uh, the numbers are really staggering. Uh, during the first six weeks of the COVID-19 crisis, Rhode Island lost 100,000 jobs. We gained back roughly half of those jobs over the course of the summer. But since then, uh, the recovery has stalled. Uh, this job loss uh, means that there are tens of thousands of Rhode Islanders who had to go home one day and tell their uh, families that uh, they no longer have work. And uh, many of those Rhode Islanders still have not been able uh, to go back to work, either in their old jobs or in anything new. Uh, so the um, severity of the situation really can't be understated. Uh, on the next slide, you can see that um, uh, this uh, uh, development has not fallen equally uh, among the Islanders. Um, this is a similar graph that's the one on the last page, similar chart is the one on the last page, but instead of showing the total job loss, it shows job loss broken out by um, uh, the, the wages uh, of these jobs. So high wage uh, defined as jobs paying 60000 a year or more. 
Middle wage jobs defined as twenty seven thousand to sixty thousand a year, and low wage jobs defined as jobs uh, uh, twenty seven thousand a year. As you can see in this graph, uh, the uh, state has actually gained high wage jobs slightly uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, but our low wage jobs, as represented in the blue line, uh, are still down 24% from the pre pandemic peak. What this basically means is that this recession, this crisis, has had a disproportionate impact on low wage workers, a disproportionate impact on people who are struggling uh, to begin with. And so this has certainly been one of the most unequal recessions that our state has experienced in modern times. On the next slide, you can see that there's also been a disproportionate impact on our communities of color. Uh, if you were black or uh, Hispanic in Rhode Island over the past year, you were significantly more likely uh, to have applied for unemployment at some point during the course of the year based on uh, data from the Department of Labor and Training. Um, so that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, now we need to look ahead toward recovery. And in times of crisis, uh, it is important that we act boldly and we think big uh, about advancing the agenda to help our state recover. Uh, bonding is a tool that can be used to help provide immediate economic stimulus for Rhode Island by investing in shovel-ready projects that can create jobs in the short run and improve our economy and our quality of life over the long run. It is a good time to go to the bond market. And I'll, I'll just pause and say bonding is a mechanism for borrowing money uh, to pay for big ticket capital expenses. Uh, so very much like when a family buys a house and gets a mortgage, um, you wouldn't take out a loan, uh, you know, ideally for ongoing annual expenses but you would take out a loan to help pay for a big ticket item like a home uh, or a college education in some cases uh, or a car in some cases uh, at the family level and similar at the state level, similarly at the state level, um, you wouldn't borrow money to pay for your ongoing annual expenses like salaries and, and employee benefits and things like that. Uh, but uh, for big ticket items, for big capital projects, uh, it makes sense sometimes to borrow money to help spread the cost over multiple budget cycles. This is a good time to go to the bond market because interest rates are incredibly low right now. Uh, we won't know exactly what interest rate we get on these bonds until we go to market in a couple months, but we can make a rough estimate by looking at what other states and cities with our same credit rating have gotten um, that have gone to the bond market recently. Rhode Island is AA rated um, and tax exempt. And when we look at other AA rated tax exempt bond issuers in recent months, uh, they've gotten an average interest rate of about 1.6% on their bonds, which is very low. So if we're going to borrow money to pay for big ticket projects, this is a good time to do it. Uh, I also want to address a question that we get sometimes, you know, where people ask, doesn't Rhode Island already have a lot of debt? And it used to be true in the 90s and the early 2000s that Rhode Island was more heavily indebted than most of our peer states. That's not really the case anymore. Um, this data is a little bit old now, but uh, as of fiscal 18, uh, our debt burden was uh, 18th in the country uh, of the 50 states. So, you know, a little above the median, but really in the middle of the pack and, and no longer uh, one of the high, most highly indebted states. Uh, as we used to be once. Um, so let's talk about the bond proposals themselves. Uh, there are seven bonds, um, all of which uh, I support and I encourage Rhode Islanders to vote yes on. Question one is the Higher Education Facilities Bond for $107 million. Uh, this is to improve uh, facilities at URI, RIC, and CCRI, specifically building a new fine arts center at URI. Uh, a major renovation to the science building at Rhode Island College, and a series of renovations uh, across uh, multiple CCRI campuses. Question two is the beach, clean water, and green bond for $74 million. Uh, there's a number of things included in this bond, including 
uh, improvements to state beaches, parks, and campgrounds. Um, uh, funding for municipal climate resiliency, uh, which is very important, giving municipalities the resources to prepare their infrastructure for the impact of rising sea levels, extreme weather, and other impacts of climate change. Um, dredging of the province river, uh, improvements to clean water and drinking water systems across the state. So a lot of good stuff in question two that will improve our quality of life immensely. <laughs> Question three is the Housing and Community Opportunity Bond for $65 million. I'll talk more about this one shortly, but we have a real uh, affordable housing crisis in Rhode Island uh, that has only gotten worse during the course of COVID-19. We desperately need to expand our supply of affordable housing in the state. This bond will put people to work doing exactly that. Question four is the Transportation Infrastructure Bond. Uh, this primarily will go toward repairing our highways uh, and bridges. Uh, it will also uh, help us um, get a significant uh, level of federal matching dollars to help pay for improving our transportation infrastructure as well. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, question five is $15 million for early childhood and educational facilities. Um, Rhode Island uh, has excellent early childhood education programs, but we need to expand access. And one of the barriers to access to early childhood education in Rhode Island is that we don't please uh, to accommodate uh, that, um, uh, uh, those programs. Um, I know this is a former elementary teacher myself. Uh, early childhood facilities require an entirely different type of layout and setup than a regular elementary school classroom does. Um, and by expanding early childhood education in Rhode Island, not only will we help more kids get off on a good start in life, but it will also be easier for many of those parents to go back to work, which is also a good thing for the economy. Question six is the cultural arts. Uh, and state preservation grant program, $7 million, uh, which will be distributed to a number of arts and historic preservation um, organizations across the state. Um, the arts economy is vital to Rhode Island and has been hit especially hard by COVID-19. Question seven, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail in a minute as well, is the industrial facilities infrastructure bond for $60 million to build out more uh, pad ready industrial sites across the state and make upgrades uh, to the Port of Davidsville at Quonset. So we'll go into more detail in a second on that. Uh, but first, I want to do a deeper dive on affordable housing um, because this is an issue that is, uh, needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed um, very urgently. Uh, this is just to kind of give people a sense of, of the scale of the problem. Uh, this is data from 2014 to 2019. Over that five-year period, uh, the yellow line is inflation, which grew about 8% over the five-year period. The gray line is median household income in Rhode Island, which grew about 20%. Now, all else equal, that would be good news. Rhode Island's median household income went up faster than inflation. That's a good thing. But the orange line at the top is the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment in Rhode Island which grew 41% over that same period. So the cost of a two bedroom apartment rose by double the amount of the increase in median household income. So a significant portion of Rhode Island families are now cost burdened, uh, having a hard time keeping up with their rent for their mortgages. And that was before COVID-19. And, you know, during COVID-19, uh, we've seen housing prices go up even more as more people are moving out of the big cities and buying vacation and other ho uh, houses in Rhode Island. Uh, so this issue has is, is really reached a critical state. So on the next slide, uh, we'll dig into what this affordable housing bond uh, question three actually does. $45 million of it will go directly into improving and increasing our supply of affordable housing. The bulk of it will go to a program called Building Homes Rhode Island, which produces more affordable housing across the state. 
Uh, I was just at a great um, uh, site in Burrowville today uh, where uh, $1.5 million from an old housing bond uh, was able to attract <clears throat> private capital and private development dollars to construct 96 units in Burrowville. So that's an important aspect of this is that uh, when we approve these affordable housing measures, uh, this money can be used to attract other private money um, to build even more housing. <laughs> um, there's also a couple million dollars in here um, as grants for individuals to build accessory dwelling units on their homes, uh, which is really important for helping particularly seniors uh, stay in their homes instead of moving into nursing homes and other congregate care settings, which again, during COVID-19 we've seen uh, how important it is to facilitate independent living as much as possible rather than congregate care and congregate living. In addition to the $45 million for expanding our supply of housing, there's another $20 million in question three for what we call community revitalization. And what this basically is, is um, funding to buy uh, properties that are vacant or in poor repair, or them into other things that will improve uh, it could be housing, or it could be uh, other things like uh, community space uh, or educational facilities. Uh, but basically, it makes uh, it's funny to make neighborhoods more livable by transforming uh, properties that are old, dangerous, vacant, etc., into something that has uh, community value. Um, I, I also just finally want to go into a little more detail on um, question seven which is the industrial facilities and infrastructure bond. Now, people think of this as being a bond for Quonset, and that is part of it, but actually the bulk of the funding in this one will go to other places. So of the $60 million in question seven, uh, $40 million of it will go to industrial site development. Uh, so what's this? It's so successful uh, to the point where there are now more than 12,000 Rhode Islanders who go to work on the Quonset campus every day, is that when companies move to Quonset, it's been developed in the sense that all of the utility lines are already there, all of the roads are already there, all of the infrastructure you need is already there, so it's very easy for a business to go and set up shop and get operational quickly because all of that site readiness work was already done decades ago. Uh, the problem is that Quonset is now almost completely full. And so what we want to do is take that same concept and create additional industrial sites elsewhere in the state where the utility lines, the roads, the infrastructure, et cetera, can all be set up in advance so that it will be easy if a company wants to move to Rhode Island or expand in Rhode Island and hire more Rhode Islanders, easy to set up shop and get scaled up quickly. So the bulk of the dollars in question seven will go to that, to setting up these industrial uh, pad ready sites throughout the state. <laughs> the um, other 20 million will go to upgrades at the Port of Davidsville at Quonset, um, predominantly to accommodate the expansion of the offshore wind industry. Uh, the offshore wind industry, uh, as, as you all probably know, is one of the most exciting economic opportunities that Rhode Island has uh, in our time. Um, not only will offshore wind help get us to being 100% renewable electricity by the end of the decade, uh, which is the goal that Governor Raimondo laid out, um, but it will create lots of good jobs in the process, not only in the upfront construction of the wind turbines, but in the ongoing maintenance. You know, wind in the coming years, but also New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts. And there's a lot of these permanent maintenance jobs that are going to be necessary in order to maintain these offshore wind farms. We want to make sure that as many of those jobs as possible are based in Rhode Island. And so that is why uh, the enhancements to Quonset uh, are necessary uh, to help um, accommodate. Uh, those offshore wind jobs. So, to sum up, um, we encourage, oh, uh, well, let me go back to the timeline real quick, actually. Um, 
we are now in the phase of the election where early and in-person voting has begun. Uh, so uh, to anyone who's watching, get out and vote. You can vote any day between now and election day in person. Uh, if you have already received a mail ballot application, uh, make sure to get that in the mail no later than February 24th in order for it to be counted in time. Um, and then uh, election day, which uh, uh, will be the final election day, uh, is uh, Tuesday, March 2nd. We're encouraging all Rhode Islanders to get out and vote. Don't only vote, but vote yes on all seven bonds. We need an economic recovery in our state. We need to put Rhode Islanders to work and make our state more economically competitive over the long run so that we can have a broad-based recovery where everyone has a chance to succeed. I want to thank you once again, uh, Councilman Breyer and uh, Representative Pissar for, uh, for organizing this town hall. Um, happy to answer any questions, but I'll just encourage everybody again, get out and vote, vote yes, and tell your friends. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I know I've, I've got a couple questions, but I want to um, give Rep. Kassar the opportunity to uh, ask anything she, she might have heard, um, questions for herself or constituents. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Jacob. And um, thank you, Treasurer, for being here. This was a, a helpful presentation. I know that you and I have been present for this a couple of times now. Um, and uh, with each time, I pick up on a, on a few different things. Um, one of the items that I've been hearing a couple of questions from constituents about is just some need for clarification around the transportation bond. Um, the expenditures on highway expansion um, and understanding what that looks like. You know, uh, folks have been watching over the past few years the invest infrastructure, um, all of the signs on the side of the road and feeling like there's quite a bit already invested. Can you talk a little more about that and how this is yeah. different? Yeah, the bulk of the um, the money in the transportation bond is basically going to um, support the roadworks program uh, to repair uh, state bridges um, on the highways. Uh, as, as you know um, uh, from your time in the House, uh, Rhode Island's bridges are among the worst rated in the country. Uh, a large number of them are structurally deficient um, and frankly dangerous. And we, we as a state let that problem fester for far too long. Uh, a couple of years ago, the General Assembly uh, took strong action to Rhode Island bridges by adopting the Roadworks Program. Uh, the Roadworks Program relies um, on funding from a few different places, significantly for this conversation, uh, funding from truck tools and also um, a portion of the state proceeds of the uh, of the motor fuel tax, the gas tax. Now what happened back uh, when COVID first began, particularly in March, April, May, traffic on the highways went down significantly. And so tolling revenue came in below expectations and the gas tax revenue came in below expectations. Uh, and that created a deficit in the program. And so the primary purpose of this bond um, plug that hole so that the roadworks program to repair state bridges can continue. Now, um, normally we are trying to get away from using state bonding to pay for uh, highway and bridge upgrades. That's, that's why we did roadworks instead. Right, uh, and that's Adelaide. why the concern, I think, that people right, are right. Just and, not and so, use bonds. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We, 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 we've been trying as a state to move away from bonding for this purpose. But this is really a one-time unique situation because of that temporary decrease in traffic that occurred in the early month. Um, and so it's sort of a one-time, one-off need to plug that hole so that we can continue to fix these bridges. Have we seen an increase at this stage um, in the revenue from the gas tax and the toll? Yeah, so I have to look at the latest data, but I believe that truck toll revenue is back up to, uh, to expectations. And, um, you know, the gas tax is not all the way back yet, but it's getting there. Um, but it's plugging the hole from, from earlier in the fiscal year. So I have a, a question that relates to that. 
that bond issue as well. And it's from uh, an article that I read recently it was an opinion piece that talked about how some cities have um, taken their highways underground and tunneled under cities so that we can reconnect communities that were disrupted by the interstate highway system. Would um, the investment here be an opportunity to, I, I know the, this bond wouldn't be enough to bring 95 under Providence, but are there opportunities here to help um, reconnect communities or to mitigate kind of the um, disruption that the highway has through the city? Yeah, I, I guess is that the cost of, of actually burying 95 mm -hmm. would be significant and well beyond the scope of this bond, but it's an interesting idea and one that you know, perhaps is worthy of conversation in the future. Um, you know, I think one of the best things that we can do to tie communities together and, and modernize our transportation system is, um, in addition to what we're doing with this bond, we need to invest more in expanding public transportation, right? There should be more ripped routes and those routes should be more, should have more frequent um, and, and should be more affordable as well. And so there's a separate plan that was recently unveiled um, called the TCI, the Transportation Climate Initiative, uh, that would essentially be a small charge on uh, companies that sell fossil fuels in Rhode Island in order to pay for transportation upgrades um, with an eye toward moving us away from fossil fuel based transportation and toward cleaner, more sustainable forms of transportation. I think that could be, you know, first of all, we need to support that and, and I encourage everyone to, but that could be a revenue source that can be very helpful in expanding uh, public transportation, which could go a long way toward, um, you know, reintegrating communities and, and particularly helping um, lower income communities and communities of color um, uh, uh, move around the state in, in a more affordable, seamless fashion. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think um, another, uh, onto a separate bond, um, the child care, um, the early child care facilities bond. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, are facilities ready for the upgrades? What will it take? Um, you know, what's the timeline? I know that COVID has impacted all of our childcare facilities pretty significantly, changed the way people think about ventilation um, and space um, and density of students. Can you talk a little bit about how this, the bond will impact that? Yeah, so, um, right, so two things. One is improving the quality of spaces that we already have. And then the second is expanding the number of early childhood education facilities, right? I think the hope is that improvements like ventilation and, um, uh, and other health and safety upgrades, hopefully, knock on wood, if, if President Biden and the Democrats in Congress are able to get uh, a large stimulus bill passed, uh, that that will include funding to help upgrade education facilities. And then this bond could be used more for expanding the number of early childhood facilities that we have in the state. But the way the bond language is written, there is flexibility there, so we could do some of both, especially if the money doesn't come from Washington like we hope it will. And is there a sense um, kind of regionally around the state where there's the highest need? Has that been established going into the bonding, or is that something that's established after? Yeah, I, I think there's need everywhere. I mean, I, I'll have to go back and look at the statistics, but I think that uh, only a quarter to, to a third of, of um, Rhode Island children have access to uh, some form of preschool, so you know, there is need everywhere. I've gotten um, a few questions in by text. Um, a couple of them I think you, you touched on when you expanded on the um, that we wouldn't be burying the highway with, with these bonds, but there were a couple questions about um, pedestrian travel and public transportation that you touched on. Um, are those efforts possible within these bonds or is that a, a future project? Uh, so pedestrian travel, certainly, and, and I think, that, you know, um, 
to the extent that some of this funding is used, you know, not just for highways but for smaller roads, you know, that that, that could be an appropriate use. But um, you know, for things like public transportation, your your primary costs there are not capital costs, they're operating costs, right? Like paying the drivers, um, for example. And so, you know, those are things where you can't really use taxes and bond financing. Um, those are really things where you need an annual budget appropriation of some sort. Um, and and that's why I think the TCI could be a good funding mechanism for expanding public transportation in Rhode Island. Not really something that, um, that bond funding is the right tool for. Okay. And then there was a, another question um, that relates to the first bond. Um, looking at the breakdown between um, URI and the other schools, the, the percentages of the bond that will be invested at each school. Um, perhaps it's, it's somebody who came late because I, I recall that from a slide. But uh, Yeah, if it's the amounts between the three colleges, mm -hmm. I, I would have to get back to the, um, to the viewer on that. Um, uh, I don't have those numbers uh, off the top of my head. Okay. And then um, I, I know there's a slide in here at the end that we didn't get to yet, but a question about um, the, the question states that all of these projects seem very important, but it's hard to translate into what the cost is and whether um, this amount of money and then the interest on top of it, if, if that's been looked at, is how much this will cost us. Yeah, so this is, uh, I'm glad that this question came because this is something that we spend a lot of time working on in our office. We keep a very close eye on the state level of borrowing to make sure that we never borrow beyond our means. Um, the whole amount of buying that's proposed is $400 million, uh, which is a lot of money, uh, but it is absolutely affordable for the state to do. Uh, we use four different metrics to measure the state's liability burden to make sure that we don't borrow beyond our means. Um, those four metrics are debt service as a percent of state revenue. So basically what percentage of the state budget goes to paying off our debts. Um, debt as a percent of personal income. Um, so, so personal per capita income for the state. Um, debt service, uh, pension costs, and state health care costs as a percent of the budget. Uh, so basically, not just regular debt, but all of our liabilities as a percent of the state budget. And then all of our liabilities as a percent of state income. Those are the four metrics that we look at. We have targets or limits, I should say, for each one of those four ratios. Uh, those limits are based on guidance from the ratings agencies and also from comparing ourselves to peer states. And so this is all a very long-winded way of saying in this slide. Um, <clears throat> we ran the projections to say, okay, if all $400 million is approved, if all seven bonds are approved by the voters, as we hope they will be, uh, what would that do to the state's debt load under these four limits? And what this slide basically shows is that even if all seven are approved, we stay well below all four of our borrowing limits, um, and we still have capacity to issue an additional $2 billion of bonds over the next three election cycles while remaining within our limits. Now, we're not necessarily recommending borrowing an additional $2 billion, but we do have the capacity to do that and still stay within our limits over the next three cycles. So um, there won't be a quiz on this later. I, I don't expect everybody to remember all the nuances of the ratios, but uh, the bottom line is uh, our office, we analyze this very closely. We have a good sense of what an appropriate level of bonding is for the state. and. Uh, the seven questions that we're advocating for uh, fall well within those limits. Oh, and Leanne was uh, helping uh, me with the presentation. Uh, just did some very quick work and found the answer to the prior question about question one, the higher education bond. Uh, in that higher education bond, $57 million would go to URI, the new fine arts building, $38 million to Rhode Island College, for the renovation to the Science Center, and $12 million to CCRI uh, for uh, upgrades across a number of their campuses. Terrific. Um, go ahead. 
<laughs> to say things. Um, Treasurer, can you talk a little bit about um, what debt is rolling off of our books at this point? What's making yeah. us for this? Because I know that you know over time, folks are have seen these questions come up. But what are we getting to the end of? Just if you can remind us. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, as you see in these projections here, uh, the numbers kind of tend to go down almost every year as you get into the out years, and that is precisely because every year we have old debt that we're paying off that's rolling off of our books. Uh, so last year alone, uh, more than $200 million of old debt, um, and that's just principal, that doesn't include interest. So um, so you're right, you know, it's not like by adding this $400 million, the total goes up $400 million. Uh, the total actually goes up by quite a bit less than that because every year we have old debt rolling off of our books. And so I thank you, uh, Rep. for reminding me to bring that up. It's a really important point. Now, I, I have one, one last question um, for me. And I know um, a lot of folks worry about borrowing now and, and incurring the cost now when we have many people out of work and many people struggling. But this, these bonds would also put people to work. Is there a rough estimate, if everything got approved and all these projects happen, is there a rough estimate of how many um, immediate jobs and then how many jobs would be sustained, you know, at the industrial new industrial park, potentially, how many jobs there, that sort of thing? Yeah. So um, I'd have to get back on the second part of your question. But on the first part, a very, very rough rule of thumb is that every million dollars spent on a construction project uh, creates about a 20 was called 20 job years, so 20 okay. jobs last one year um, on average. And so if you figure, you know, $400 million of bonding, almost all of which goes into construction projects of one type or another, mm -hmm. then, you know, what's 400 million times, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, 400 times 20 would be, uh, 8,000 8, construction job years, which yeah. um, which is a lot. And you know, as far as permanent jobs, um, I'd have to get back to you on that number because there's a number of different yeah. parts to that. But uh, that's a good. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get back on that. Okay. But it's a lot. <laughs> I think um, following up on that question, um, you know, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the three categories of um, kind of the income levels that um, that we've lost, you know, sort of the job loss by a category. Um, and I'd just be curious as you get that information, if the, I know it's forecasting and forecasting is, you know, part art, part science, but if we can sort of get a sense of where these jobs lead us, because I think, you know, um, when we're investing in the childcare facilities, um, both, uh, the renovations, but also the new facilities. Not only are we creating the jobs that are the construction jobs and the maintenance jobs, but we're also creating workplaces for the small business sector that is the care economy to continue. So I'd be curious to know if there's any forecasting that gets done to understand not only the space, the infrastructure, but then that facilitates the ability of the economy to grow in certain ways, especially in our case from housing you know, uh, child care, education, those are elements of, um, of the economy that have sort of the longer lasting um, impact. Absolutely. And, and I, it's an important point, and I'd be very happy to, to work together with you on that, on, on trying to get a sense of what that impact, uh, where that impact will fall. Yeah, that would be great. I would like to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, um, that kind of brings us to our our time, and I, I didn't have anything um, more. Uh, Rep. Kassar, did you? Have any? I just want to say thank you, Trainer. I I have to admit I have been in the audience for this particular presentation more than once, and I know from that experience that more than once actually helps. So I would like to think that this is an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, Jacob, you and I um, here in town are available as resources um, to answer more questions and to get answers to these questions. But the critical thing is we've got a special election that is so unique. We're still under COVID. Um, you know, we don't have
candidates knocking at the door and leaving leaflets. Like this is a little bit of a different game um, as far as an election goes. It really is so critical to the investments that are going to be made in the state. Yet there's a high likelihood of a link to get the word out about, um, you know, talk to your neighbors about the bonds sort of thing. Um, make sure to take advantage of early in-person voting um, and return mail ballots. I know I've got mine on the kitchen counter waiting to be filled out and returned. Um, but I also have a new voter in the house. So I've been talking to her about why this is such a different election. So um, I just, I think the more information we can get out, the better. Um, but really, you know, early in person voting now for everyone and just making sure we have some serious numbers on, on March 2nd. Yeah, and I'll just thank you both in that vein for um, for organizing this uh, this virtual event to help us get the word out. Um, to your point, uh, we are living in um, uncommon times for sure, uh, but that makes it all the more important that we we act big and we act boldly to uh, to help our state recover. So, thank you both for for helping us to get the word out. Yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us, and thanks thank to you. Leanne for the for the 